So let's talk about the book of Daniel a minute. The book of Daniel. It is an extraordinary blend of historical narrative. What I mean by that is story, story. It highlights uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego's faithfulness to God, front and center. Pointedly, when their faith is challenged, and the stories are magnificent, and it starts already today with today's text. The other half, chapter 7 through 12, is mostly prophetic visions. It's actually apocalyptic in nature. So when you hear that word, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's all about sort of visions and hard to understand, but yet sometimes we get an interpretation, especially through Daniel, because he can interpret dreams. So we get to know what some of them are. They uh, are often a blending of the present, the past, and the future. And it's hard to determine what's what. But we'll, we'll spend some time sorting through that with humility. So the first part of the book is about God's provision and protection over his faithful followers. And second, the showcasing of God's sovereignty. This is not in doubt in all those visions. God's sovereignty over history, over nations over rulers, and any earthly kingdom. God is sovereign. Now, there's definitely going to be some chance for us, an opportunity to sort of think, how do some of these stories, even today in messages, when we understand what was going on then, we can sort of understand maybe what God's word is for us today. <laughs> you want to know what one is already? <laughs> Don't put your hope in presidents. Put your hope in God. God is sovereign. When we study Daniel and his friend's life and the things they were faced with, sort of like uh, living in exile, right, in a foreign place, just asked to sort of like incorporate, challenged to sort of compromise too in all kinds of ways, they stand firm in their identity of who they are in God, even to threat of their life. It's stunning story. It has profound implications for us today. You see, God's word is timeless. Certainly it had a message for God's people then. Certainly it has a message for God's people now. So as we explore Daniel, we hold it like with any book, right? We hold it with open hands, like, God, would you lead us? Spirit, would you teach us? And we'll have time to talk about that and look at those things. In the first six chapters, we see bold decisions made, displaying faith, integrity, humility, courage to stand for godliness over against the culture of their captivity. Now, don't, don't think, oh, it was just over and against and all. Of, no, 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 no. They, they became integrated in many ways into the culture they were in. That's, that's not the issue here. It's more like when it came to their devotion to God and worshiping God, what is it that they would settle for and what is it that they wouldn't? That's more it. So as we dive in, we'll look at some of that. I mean... To the threat of their own lives, they rejected the king's food. They prayed when they weren't supposed to. <laughs> they refused to bow down to the king's idol. And with all of these interpretations of Daniel and the king's dreams, which really takes up a lot of the book, he didn't take any credit for it. Daniel, every time, and this is what I want you to notice even when I read the text for this morning for us, okay, when I read the text, be listening. And I'm going to ask you, well, who's the main actor in the book of Daniel? This, this is obvious, right? Daniel. No. <laughs> so be listening for it. The text instructs us and teaches us in so many ways about God, who he is, what he does, all of this stuff. So chapter one, I'm going to set up the plot, and I'm simply going to read the text for today, and we'll see what time we are at. The Israelites are carried into Babylonian captivity. 
Now, uh, those of you doing the read through the Bible, you're reading Joel and Amos and all these other prophets. We just read Hosea not too long ago, right? Um, so in, in reading these, you sort of understand that God for a long time has been saying, return to me, repent of your sins, your neglect of the widow and the orphan, your cheating people out of their property, your you name it, all kinds of things. And the people continued on the path of disobedience. And it comes a point, it seems like, right, where God just says, okay, you're going to be taken off into captivity. And that day has come, and Daniel and his friends find themselves now in uh, Babylonia. Their Hebrew birth names are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And they are selected by uh, uh, the king's attendant as already showing some aptitude. They actually had to be a part, or they were part of the nobility and royal family. We'll ask a question about why, why would that be important to Nebuchadnezzar. And then also, they were handsome. They showed aptitude of all kinds, you know, of knowledge and learning. So... So they rose sort of the top already, and then they went into a three-year training program to be selected as the king's closest, you know, servants. And they're given different names, okay? I'll explain the names later. But they're given different names, names that are of the Babylonians. So almost like giving them a new identity, <laughs> a new point of reference for how they are greeted and met and known. And they are required to eat the king's food from his own table as preparation part of the training. Yet Daniel and his friends refused to eat the king's food as it would defile them. And we'll talk about that. What does that mean? Daniel makes a special request of the king's attendant. Instead of the king's food, he wants to choose and ask that they could, he and his friends could eat a diet of vegetables and water and that's it. After 10 days, they appear healthier than others, and so the king changes the diet for everyone to Daniel's and elevates the four of them to special service in the king's service. That's the outcome in the end. A process, by the way, three years. And God gives to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah wisdom and understanding. Okay, the text. You ready? Let's stand, and I'll read Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude of every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Meshach, Me, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord, the King, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The King would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give me nothing, give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. And he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. 
So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Now this is why, just as I, your mom said, eat your vegetables. <laughs> this is also why vegetarians say to carnivores, I told you so. No, no, no. To, the, to these four men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to ha Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. So at this point, all right, about this time, a little before quarter after 10 each Sunday, this is the time where we would like to have our children age, and there will be teachers out there ready to meet with you, all right, and you guys can have an activity for a half hour until we're finished two in here, and up to our uh, mid-high school, okay, and, and high school too. So... If you'd like to, leaders can go out, all right, and do that, and you guys can go. And the Lord bless you in your time together. All right. What? Look at that. That's beautiful. Now you guys have to stay. I'll tell you what, I think this is fine to just, you just stay where you are today, but I think in the future what we'll try to do is come a little closer for this time. That way you can hear people, right, if they respond or, or they, they give a, um, some kind of question or an answer. So after hearing this text, I'm curious what it is that has struck you as you heard it. What did you notice? What did you see? Anyone want to add anything at this point? It's kind of a free-for-all for that. <laughs> What's that? No yeah, no compromise. And we'll talk about this a little bit in a little more detail because you, you have this phrase in there, Daniel didn't want to defile himself. Well, what does that actually mean, right? And he's like, oh, there's something, something with the food, maybe? Yes? But uh, there's more going on, I think, in the story. What else? Anybody? They took some things from the temple. Yeah, so, so Nebuchadnezzar literally came into Jerusalem. The Holy Grail? The Holy Grail, maybe. I, <laughs> Ten, Commandments. Ten Commandments. I mean, well, you know, you've got all those articles in there for the Holy of Holies. So did those go, right? Um, it, but, but think about that. It's like, oh, you're a people... Uh, who worship God, you have this long history of deliverance from Egypt. You have this long history of covenants and promises. You're led into a promised land, and now you see all of it just basically destroyed and carted off. Where is God? Right? It's a good question. What else did you notice? Anything? Anyone want to? What's that? Training. Training. Yeah. Three years is pretty significant. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Esther, right? She went into sort of the king's harem, and they went through a lot of training and other things before they were presented to the king. Similar in some ways. Yes? Well, God's making them stand out. Yeah. Who is making them stand out? God. Yes. Sometimes it's hard when I'm up here and I just read through the text, right? You, you can't maybe catch or hear some. There's, there's three significant phrases in the text that jump out really highlights Muffy's choice of words there in the order. Here it is. Chapter 1, verse 2 already. The Lord delivered Judah into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. What do you think of that? The Lord. Wow, he's sovereign. Really? 
allow your people to go into exile? 1 verse 9. God caused the official to show favor to Daniel's request. Oh, that's significant too. What would have happened if God had not made the attendance favorable to Daniel's request? Might have gotten kicked out. Might have gotten kicked out. Think about the risk he took. He's supposed to feed them the food from the king's table so that when they are presented to the king, what if they don't look great? What if they don't look good? Whose head is on the table? The attendants, right? Probably Daniel, the others too. Or they just get dismissed. I don't, the text doesn't just tell us all those details. But God made the attendants' heart favorable to Daniel's request. Now I want to ask another question here. Why else might the attendant be favorable to Daniel's request? And you can fill in the blanks. It's okay to try to come up with a wonder. What do you think? Could there be anything in your mind that you can think of? Cheaper to feed. Oh, cheaper to feed. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Super practical. Vegetables and water, much cheaper than all this fancy king's food and wine. I wonder, this is what I wondered about. I wondered if Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, I wonder if their sort of reputation of the kind of character of people that they are is already preceding them. That when they ask the attendant, the attendant is like, oh wow, that's a big request. We could get in trouble, but okay. 10-day test. 10-day test doesn't do a ton, right? <laughs> you want to know something interesting that's really interesting about this um, story is, and, and we'll, maybe we'll get a deeper into it with the defilement question. Uh, like, Daniel did not want to be defiled. Okay, did, was it the food? Where, was the king making them drink or eat pork? Or was he doing, uh, making them eat things that are non-kosher? Uh, maybe, but definitely doesn't have to be part of the story. Um, was it that fact that it kind of came from the king's table and that there were, it was sort of like food that was blessed and offered in idols, names, and things like that? Uh, maybe. L listen to this. Could be, right? Because, okay, Daniel's name is changed to Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar means the divine lady protects the king. Okay? That's his new identity, his name. You want to know what his name Daniel means? God is my judge. You see what's going on here in the text? Right in their names? How about Azariah? The Lord is my help. Well, what does Abednego mean? Servant of Nebu. Hmm. Hananiah. God has been gracious. Hebrew name. His new name, right? Command of Aku a god of the Babylonians. Might even refer to Marduk, another god of the Babylonians. Mishael, who is what God is? That's what his name means, Mishael. Who is what God is? You know, you know what his new name is? Meshach? Who is what, who is what Aku is? Daniel didn't want to defile himself, so just test me in this. In that day, if you wanted to eat that food, okay, uh, of the king's table, do you, you want to know what the desired appearance was for them? That they were actually kind of chubby? That was what was desired? That they would actually um, have an appearance more of eating all that king's food, right? It has, it has all that other, other things in it. Now think about vegetables and water. <laughs> Seems like the, the diet of someone not trying to gain some weighted appearance where you're right, that sort of look of health. Isn't that interesting? It kind of changes a little bit how we think about this. So what is it that Daniel may be doing in this? They're, they're being prepared, right, to be chosen as servants. Um, they are of nobility, 
Uh, it says right at the beginning of the text, he picks some from the nobility and the royal family. So Daniel, Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael are part of that in some way. Why would a king choose some from the royal families? Any thought on that? Why? Why not just anyone? Yeah. Yeah, sort of like let's bring other people, right, into whatever, right, so that there's sort of like this, yeah, some blessing comes down, some uh, maybe the people can be more on your side even though they're in captivity. There's probably lots of reasons. Lots of reasons. Um, yeah. Like it. Yeah, the royals have to be servants, sort of as a show of, I'm, I'm your lord and king. So let's go back to the defilement question after some of the things I told you, just a few things about what that could mean or not mean. What could be some possible reasons for why Daniel wants to do this and have this test? And he basically tries it with the attendant before he gets to sort of the level of the king, right? But why would he do this? And I would love to, if you have any thoughts about it, okay? I'll read about one of mine that I think I've zeroed in on from my study, which surprised me, actually. Wasn't what I was thinking. Anyone want to venture an idea about that? Why did Daniel want to do this test? What was he doing? Maybe he was worried if he agreed to one thing, he expected to, in order to mark him as one to... Agree to one thing. Yeah, and then you're expected to conform to the next thing. If I give on this, maybe, right? Yeah, I like that. I think that it, it, it could very well be some of what's going on. The compromise issue that I think Eileen mentioned. Yes? I would, I, I sort of think that he felt that he was doing the right to let them think they were coming down there. Like he had no choice. He had, he had no choice. This is what he needed to do. And I, I'm now thinking of people um, on hunger strikes where they black out in the U.S., right? Where with their principles and their Yeah. Daniel, not my new name, you know, I cannot do that. Yeah. So he, of course, would want to be able to keep the temple secret or whatever, but that bottom line, what, what it gets back to, you shouldn't forget it, you know, would he have been that free? Yes. I think no. An alternative to starvation, also making a stand on what he believes. Right? He needs to do. Did I capture some of that? Mm -hmm. well, no, he wanted to show that the laws of God are better for us than the laws of the king. The laws of God are better than the laws of the king. You could maybe say the ways of God, right, are better than the ways of the Lord, or that the Lord is the true God. Nebuchadnezzar, you are not. I mean, there's lots of things that I can hear in what you're saying. I like, there you go. I like that a lot. Because, um, and they're all good and all possible. But when I did my study and stuff like that, what came out of, the, uh, of it was this idea that I think is along those lines. That Daniel set up a scenario so that God could show himself to be God. It's similar, right? It's like a tangent of that. And he puts his life on the line in some ways to do it. Now, this, this is just the beginning, by the way. Fiery furnace, lion's den. <laughs> it's almost like a test, pretest. If they ate vegetables and water, okay, you and I here, are, we're from Boulder, so we think, oh man, they're going to look way better. They are not. 
not according to what Nebuchadnezzar wants. They are not. Yet, what happens? God honors this. God acts. And at the end of 10 days, they look better than the others. Here's the third place that God is mentioned. 117. God gave knowledge and understanding to them. So here's another thing. We, we start the story and we're like, oh, these people were picked because of this, 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 this. Well, who gave it to them? God did. And it continues to emphasize that God gave them knowledge and understanding. That he gave them God's a grace, a favorable appearance, an aptitude, right, of all kinds, and then ends with sort of a precursor of what's coming. It's like a foreshadowing. And Daniel has the gift of interpreting dreams. Now, every time we get to, I think the very next chapter, next week, we're going to talk about Daniel's dream. Already, there's going to be one. And Daniel interprets it, but right at the beginning, you'll notice, he says, oh no, I can't do it. Who can? God can. Going back to what, what Roland said, to do that, to, to come up with some kind of test like this, what do you, th what, what, what kind of risk is there in doing that? It's a pretty big risk. He's going to look bad, right? What if God doesn't come through? <laughs> I'm sure Daniel thought about that too. Something was more important to him. He's always in his life, you can see it all throughout the book, you're going to see this again, they, uh, that all four of these men, and, and they're young, by the way, they're impressionable. They go into this training of three years, you know, it's not just physical appearance. You want to know what else they're learning? They're learning all the mythology. They're learning all the false religion. You know there's going to be thing after thing after thing where they're going to be challenged, and we're going to see it. Yet, already, they dis Daniel decides to put this test out there, and I think it has everything to do with God's glory, that God be glorified. Now, think about that. If you were um, taken into captivity, and that's what you did, you were, take, you know, you were removed from your home, Right, forcibly carted off and taken to a totally another other land. You know, some of you are thinking, man, well, maybe that'd be fun, right? It'd be an adventure. I mean, this was this was a big deal. Hard. Start a new life. Learn all new rhythms. Separated from family, people you love, all these kind of things, right? And yet, what does this story open with? It opens with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. All right? Still trusting in God. It's good. Good start. So who's the main actor? God. And as we go through the rest of the book of Daniel, let's keep that in mind. Um, um, that, that Daniel appeared before the king, which would have been at the end of the training. So all this stuff before that very end of this chapter, I believe, I don't think he appears before the king. So right? Was he eating the king's food prior to this? Good question. I don't know. Like, has he already? Sure. Good question. 
I, I think there's a good question to ask of the text, right? but I don't, I don't know if the text gives us the answer. It's a good wonder. I would say maybe what came to my mind is that, you know, the question is, did he, did he eat the king's food beforehand? Um, I don't know, maybe I should just say this. Uh, was Daniel a sinner? Of course. Oh, today's world. Okay, so um, Israel and Judah, right, up against the sea. You go to the north. I'll give a map next week, okay? And you're going, and I'm not sure about exactly how many miles, all right, but it's, it's a ways away. And you're going up to the north and over. Something in my head says Arabia. Iraq and Iran. Iraq and Iran. So... If you know your geography, you know, that's where, that's where they went. They got carted off to the north and then over east. A ways. That's a good question. That's something I, I wish I had on the top of my head. Um, yeah, what is it modern day today? Mm -hmm. So Daniel's asking for a miracle. He's asking God to act. Yeah, I I would say so too. I mean, definitely God's been working in their lives already. Because the fact that they, I think their character already was known somewhat by the attendant. I do. Yeah, God made him favorable, but I also think there's something about their character and who they are, that they're trusted people. You make an outrageous request. Who, who doesn't want to eat from the king's table? The king's food. It's the best. So let me ask a little different question today. Um, and give me a second to look at this because I want to make sure. Okay, this is the question I want to ask. Um, so what? So what? I actually wonder, if, and I believe the word of God is like this, right? And the Bible speaks about itself this way, that it's sharper than a two-edged double sword. It cuts down to the heart of things, right down to bone and marrow. It can separate them, meaning it comes down to truth. It cuts to the heart, right? It, it opens us up before God, where nothing is hidden from him. And I wonder, like, with a text like this, like any other Sunday, anything you've heard, like, what... What does it stir up in you in the Holy Spirit to answer the question, so what? Hey, that's a nice story. No. How does this sort of speak to us today? I, I got a few things here, but I, I mean, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll go through these and start going through some of these so you can continue to think. But if you have something... Just, you know, do this, and I'll, I'll try to acknowledge it so we can all hear maybe what that could be, all right? This isn't meant to embarrass anybody or right or wrong. It's, it's more like, what is God doing in your heart? So what? I think one thing that it means, can mean, is that we need to look for God for our daily bread. So what came to my mind was the Lord's Prayer. Our Father art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, right? Give me today my daily bread, what it is I need. It's almost like a spiritual thing too, like he's just relying on God for his daily bread. 
whether it's physical daily bread of vegetables and water or just his trust. And I go back to the lines of the text, and I think the text guides us. The Lord delivers, yep, even into captivity. Can you believe that? The Lord causes, no, that's a tough one. You know, I don't, I don't believe God causes evil. I don't believe, you know, I, uh, that's a different discussion, but the Lord caused the attendant to be favorable to their request. And the Lord gave them. Uh, what, a, what a posture, right, of surrender to God's will be done. Bless you. I usually do them in twos and threes, so, you know, get blessed again. Here's another one. Don't put your hope in princes. I started with that. They'll disappoint you every time. Be careful who and what you champion. I'm telling you what, as Christians, we absolutely need to be involved in politics. We need to be involved in sort of local governance of our cities and towns, schools. We need to be engaged. We can speak our faith into those things. But don't put your hope in them. You know how easy it would be for Daniel, right, and his friends to simply just eat the food, simply believe the myths, simply accept what they're being taught without question. <laughs> they don't do that at all. Put your hope in the Lord. Third, what if you were asked to do something that is clearly against God's will, God's desire and design and calling for you? Could you repeat that question? Yeah, and I don't know if it's a, a perfectly good question. What if you were asked to do something that is clearly against God's will or desire or design for you, his calling on your life? Yeah. yeah, it's like we said, right? You know, vegetarians say, I told you so. Pray. <laughs> Daniel resolves to serve Yahweh. Congratulations, Carrie and Atticus. At the uh, last Sunday, up on Flagstaff, here's a copy of your license. <laughs> now, here's, here's why I say it, you know, here's why I even mention that. I, I mention that because we all love them and we champion you. Uh, another reason is I mentioned something, I think, during the message time up there about Joshua. And I said, Joshua said, okay, he's leading the people into a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you think Nebuchadnezzar's palace be, is just flowing with milk and honey? Yeah. Absolutely. The best of the foods, the best of everything. And Joshua says, choose today before you enter. <laughs> who it is that you are going to serve. And he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because there are giants in the land. There are giants in the land. I mentioned too that this was sort of the same message that Dion and I were given to on our wedding day and it's always stuck with me. It's like, you know, we are in this world but we are not of it, people. We've been called out of darkness into God's light. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, set apart in the name of Jesus Christ, by the work of Jesus Christ, for his glory and his doing, period. We live in the world, right? We live within culture. We live within our neighborhoods. 
But it doesn't mean that we compromise and assimilate to everything. Jesus said we are to be salt and to be light. I think all of these things are just themes that are like, they come out of Daniel already. Let your light shine that they may see who you serve and give glory to God. Now, as Daniel interprets dreams, and I'm going to wrap it up real shortly because we're going to a fellowship meal. Um, see, I thought about the fellowship meal. I, I, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Must not have been any good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's funny. That happens to me sometimes. <laughs> so I'll end with this, and then we'll pray. I think what Daniel, the book of Daniel shows through all these stories we're going to encounter, what it shows is that um, the honoring of and life commitment and trust and surrender to the first commandment of God. Do you know what the first of the Ten Commandments is? What is it? Thank you, Steve. I heard a bunch of people say it. But Steve, you prolonged the longest. And... <laughs> I project. <laughs> I project. Think about that, folks. Like, what does that mean for you in your life today? You shall have no other gods before you. What's the first commandment Jesus says, the first and greatest? Love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is Daniel. Love God alone. Think about the pressure, okay? I, I think there's lots of pressure today. There is to conform to things that are not of God. Lots of pressure. Think about the pressure that Daniel and his friends had. Think about it. You're part of the nobility and the royalty. You get taken away. You get offered this into a whole new thing. You could just learn it all, believe it all, and walk in it all. And they, all of them will say, no. No. I'm going to read to you what some of the text of the quarter is, and then I'm going to pray and we'll end. I think it's from Listen to this. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. I'm like, where's Daniel? It's kind of interesting, you know, the story about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They're told they have to bow down to this big huge uh, idol. They don't. I mean, imagine that. Everybody's bowing. Hey, people, everybody's doing it. What's the big deal? Out of all of them, they stand. Think about that. And I talked about, like, okay, God will deliver me. I have trust in that. But listen to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is part of our text of the quarter. King Nebuchadnezzar, and they're, they're beefing up this fire, hotter and hotter. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, think about this. You've been taken into captivity. Even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods and worship the image of gold that you have set up. Amen. Even if they die. It's spectacular. So, I would love to just, this is our... <laughs> This is our maiden voyage today. I don't know how this worked for you, but it worked for me. <laughs> and um, each week we'll do different kind of things, all right? Like uh, sometimes we'll actually break in, uh, you know, you can talk with people next to you and things like that. This was more of just me and a crowd. Other times I may actually have other people lead this time. I'll do the initial time, right, in our all-together worship, but then I may have someone else lead this time, and I'll go to a children's room for the day. I'll hold the babies for a day, okay? We're in this together. I think it'll be good. Um, let me pray as we go from here and also as we go out to fellowship. Um, 
God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for uh, this place and space that you have placed us. Lord, as we continue to explore Daniel, would you, by your Holy Spirit, do what you say you will do and just open up your word to us? I, I think of so many messages that come out today, but there's, there's something pointedly for each one of us, something that you'd have us do and live into, and I pray that you'd continue to make that clear for everyone. Lord, as we fellowship today with just a meal, um, we fellowship in your presence. Uh, and uh, Lord, may your will be done in us today. We pray this in Jesus' name.